everyone. This lesson is going to be on a very small gland located deep within your brain. It's sometimes described as a pea-sized gland embedded within your brain. And it's also sometimes referred to as the third eye. We'll kind of see why in a little bit here, the third eye, uh, the pineal gland. So the pineal gland produces this hormone here, melatonin. And melatonin is responsible for regulating it goes by several different names. I have here the biological clock. It's also called the circadian rhythm or simply your sleep-wake cycle. So uh, really kind of an interesting picture that we have uh, on this first slide here. So it shows a whole bunch of different kind of bodily functions that are going on throughout the 24 hours in a day. So if we start at the bottom here, this is midnight. So midnight is time zero and it's also time 24 hours. This is showing the 2400 hour clock, so zero and 2400 hours. So that would be midnight, 24 hours after, well, the first midnight. So yeah, lots of interesting things here. So your deepest sleep, they say, is at about two in the morning. Your lowest body temperature, 430 in the morning. Highest body temperature, 1900 to seven o'clock at night. And a whole bunch of neat things in here as well, like blood pressure, when it's the sharpest increase, where it's the highest, when it's the best time to, well, maybe work out, when you have your fastest reaction time. But what we're really most interested in for this picture, of course, is the melatonin. So at the top here, this, um, well, what it's trying to show is this is where there is light. And of course, where there is light is during the daytime. At the bottom, this is where it's dark. And when it's dark, that's during the nighttime. So what we're interested in is this one here, melatonin, and over here, melatonin. So let's start with this one. 2100 hours is nine o'clock at night. That is when melatonin secretion by the pineal gland starts. In other words, that's when it goes up. Melatonin secretion goes up when it starts to get dark. Over the other side is where the sun comes up. Melatonin secretion is going to go down. So again, over here, it's sun up and you get the light. Over here, it's kind of the opposite. Sun down and you get the increased production in the dark. So let's see why that is the case and what's going on with the pineal gland and the melatonin. So yes, the stimulus for the production, it's not light, but it is in fact the darkness. And that is what it is showing in this picture here. We'll take a closer look on the next slide exactly where this pineal gland is located. It's not really pointing exactly to it, unfortunately, in this picture. It's more like about in this region than where that line is pointing to. But in the light, it's actually inhibited and melatonin production goes down. It is in the dark that we do have the stimulation of the pineal gland and the melatonin production goes up. So again, what is it responsible for? Well, here I just have it as well the sleep-wake cycle. So when you feel sleepy is when it starts to get dark and that's because melatonin goes up. When you feel like waking up and you're no longer tired, that's when it's light, and that's because the melatonin production goes down. So increased melatonin in the dark, decreased melatonin in the light is the pattern that you should keep in mind. This picture here of the brain, I'm a little bit more accurate in terms of the location. So just to kind of orient you again, this is the front of the brain that we're taking a look at. This is the back of the brain. We know this is the back of the brain because right here is the, I'll just put C for cerebellum, which is responsible for muscle control and balance. Up here, this is the thalamus, that major relay center in the brain. So this is the region of the brain that kind of dictates where information is going to within the brain. So major directing center in the brain, the thalamus. So the pineal gland is kind of sandwiched in between the thalamus and the cerebellum. 
and it's essentially between the two cerebral hemispheres. So even though it's not exactly in the area of the cerebral hemispheres, it's more centrally located, it is right in the middle of the brain. So in fact, if you put your finger on the bridge of your nose right here and point straight back, that's essentially where your pineal gland would be located and approximately from just behind your ears as well if you're going from the sides. So why is this also referred to as the third eye? Well, you have two eyes, of course, and what those eyes do is they take in light information that's coming from the external environment. So photoreceptors in the retina, they're going to generate the action potentials. And those action potentials, as we know, they send the information to be processed about the image to the primary vision center. And that, of course, is right at the back of the brain, the lobe at the back or lobes at the back, right above the cerebellum. And that, of course, is the occipital lobes. Occipital lobes because there is one in each one of these cerebral hemispheres. But that's not what we're interested in here. We're not interested in vision. We're interested in how is it that the pineal gland is able to detect light? Well, at the same time that light information is going to the occipital lobe, there's also information from the eyes that is going to the pineal gland. So although the pineal gland in itself is embedded deep within the brain and it doesn't have access to the light directly, it is getting information well directly from the eyes and that's why it is referred to as the third eye. So once again, the key is stimulation of the production of melatonin when it's dark and there's actually no light going in through the eyes. Um, melatonin, you certainly don't need to know the chemical structure of melatonin. We tend to uh, very briefly talk about the fact that steroid hormones have a complex ring-like structure. Um, that's actually not what we're talking about here. So this one is not a steroid hormone, it would be a non-steroid hormone. So this one here is an amino acid derived hormone. It is not a steroid hormone. Just as a reminder, steroid hormones, remember, are really only produced by four different locations in your body. The cerebral cortex produces cortisol and aldosterone. If you're a male, the testes produce testosterone, that's a steroid hormone. If you're a female, the ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone. And if you're a pregnant female, then the uterus also produces estrogen and progesterone. The adrenal cortex is also responsible for producing some of these sex hormones. So the point now is just that this here is not a steroid hormone. It is amino acid or protein derived hormone, as are most of the hormones. So what are the effects Again, we've already seen a little bit of this. It does regulate your sleep-wake cycle. And in fact, if you were left completely in the dark, then your body actually runs on a 24 and a half hour a day cycle. But of course, there aren't 24 and a half hours in a day. There are 24 hours in a day. And so what the light actually does, the pineal gland and melatonin, it just kind of resets it so your body does run on the 24 hour per day cycle, which is the light and dark cycle that we do have. Um, it does have an influence on some other hormones as well. Again, a whole bunch of different hormones are linked together by the stimuli and the responses. So this also has an influence on growth hormone and cortisol acting through the hypothalamus. So what are some problems associated with the production of melatonin or the inadequate production of melatonin? or things that kind of mess up with the normal production of melatonin and in turn would have an impact on your biological clock. Various different kinds of depression, but this one here, specifically related to the melatonin production, is referred to as seasonal affective disorder, a disorder that has to do with the seasons. And as we'll see, it's not really temperature, but it is the amount of light. And kind of appropriately, it is also abbreviated SAD for seasonal affective disorder. Uh, jet lag also has an impact on your natural rhythm and kind of messes up things with your circadian cycle. And not necessarily leading to depression, but certainly can lead to uh, fatigue 
if someone is experiencing a jet lag. So just a few um, visuals that I have at the bottom here, kind of interesting here. So facts, this fact sheet about seasonal affective disorder. So um, yeah, millions of people around the world that are affected, people that are affected most are a long ways away from the equator. So the equator kind of cuts across like this. Those people are not affected by seasonal affective disorder. Um, northern polar regions, so in this picture here, that would be Russia and it would be Northern Europe. In fact, probably most of Russia and Europe in the wintertime. And uh, Canada, pretty much all of Canada, Alaska, even the Northern United States, and also in the Southern Hemisphere. So New Zealand, Australia, Southern part of Africa, these would also be some countries that are affected by this seasonal affective disorder. So what is going on? Um, so this is specific for the Northern Hemisphere, this data sheet here. So SAD is usually most severe between, and again, this is the Northern Hemisphere, December and February. So what do we know about between December and February? Well, we know that the sun sets earlier in the day and it rises later in the morning. So we have less daylight throughout the day. That's really what it comes down to is it is the amount of light. It's not the temperature or anything else. It is the amount of light. So yes, lack of sunlight is going to be disrupting the normal circadian rhythm. So um, a simple sort of treatment for this in terms of the depression is going to be light therapy. So the problem is there's not enough light. So that's what this picture here is showing. This isn't a window, it's not an airplane window, but it is in fact a, a light, which is specifically for seasonal affective disorder. So it provides the appropriate wavelength of light, which would be simulating what you would be exposed to in the summertime and what people are lacking during the winter time if you do live in these polar regions. So it can affect, um, yeah, people of all different ages. So it's not like it's just the elderly that might already have sleep problems as it is. It can be anyone, males, females, that can be affected by this seasonal affective disorder. So yes, it is the changes in the seasons, but once again, I do wanna stress the part about the seasons that we are really referring to is the amount of light and the less light that is available in the winter time in these polar regions around the globe. So yes, it is considered to be, in fact, it truly is a form of depression that we are talking about. So what can people do? Well, they can again, use these lights here. Um, melatonin. So it does mess a little bit with the melatonin production. So uh, you can purchase bottled up melatonin, and I can't comment on the effect of this or the quality of this, but you can uh, just purchase it in health stores, the melatonin. So it's not something that you typically require a prescription for. And the idea is that if we're not exposed to the same amount of light and it's messing up the pattern of the light and dark, then maybe taking melatonin as a supplement might be able to help with this. You do need to be very careful with any kind of hormone replacement therapy. So this is a hormone. And there are other hormone replacement therapies, for example, for estrogen, testosterone, a growth hormone. But you have to be really, really careful because hormones, remember, they do work in incredibly low concentrations, parts per million, parts per billion, maybe even parts per trillion. So if you are taking bottled up, and in fact, if they are effective versions of melatonin, again, again that might be sort of questionable but certainly a little bit of this can have big impacts because it does act in such low concentrations. So the other one here is jet lag. So the concern is not with hopping on a plane and traveling for an hour and maybe even within the same time zone. The problem is when you're crossing multiple different time zones. So with international travel, you go from one part of the world to another part of the world, completely different time zone. And that is what is really going to be messing up with the circadian cycle. So again, some people claim that melatonin helps with that as well, but certainly it does lead to fatigue for several days in order for your body to adjust and acclimatize to that new time zone. So one final picture that we will take a look at here and just to kind of orient ourselves again in terms of this graph that we're seeing, this is the melatonin production. Don't be too concerned at all about the units, just that the levels are increasing as we do go from the origin. It's the 24 hour clock that we're talking about again here. So this 12 p.m. right in the middle, 
this is midnight, which means 12 hours later, this would be noon, and 12 hours prior, this would be noon as well. So pretty much all throughout the day, from 8 in the morning all the way through to 8 at night, the levels of melatonin are fairly low. But then we start to see this inflection. We start to see the increase. So on a previous one, the very first one, in fact, we saw it increasing at about 2,100 hours or 9 o'clock at night. Here it just shows it a little bit earlier, so it doesn't really matter that much. But the point is we can see that when we do have the highest levels of melatonin, it's essentially in the middle of the night. So according to this here, it might be uh, roughly 2 o'clock in the morning, 0,200 hours that we have the highest amount of melatonin. And once again, that of course is in the dark, whereas everything over here, this is in the light, and this is in the light. So to finish it off, once again, that is the stimulus for the production of the melatonin is the darkness.